Welcome to the Fabulous Vistas and Beyond. As you can see from on the table here already, we're going to be discussing a topic that some of you will remember quite well, but we're going to be talking about Aladdin lamps. You stay tuned and we'll be right back. And he'd say, go with what you got. Start from where you are. Give it your best shot. Keep reaching for that star. Get in the race. Keep your own pace. Keep moving and never stop. Just go. Go. Hey, go with what you got. Our guest today is Bill Coulter. Is that the way that I pronounce it right, Bill? Quarter. Quarter, okay. Bill is, a, is an author and uh, would you say collector? Collector, certainly. Of Aladdin lamps, uh, something that goes way back in all of our own history. And Janetta was talking about her mother's Aladdin lamp that she's trying to figure out where it is or where it ended up. Yeah, who got the, it? Who got it, I guess, is, is, is the question, you know. Aladdin Lamps have been around a long time. When did they start? Give us a little history of, of the company, Bill. Aladdin Lamps uh, started out in 1908. So we're looking at uh, 100 years coming up next year. And Aladdin is a brand name. It was selected by Mr. Victor Johnson. And he formed a company in Chicago called the Mantle Lamp Company of America. And he developed these models. And we have here model number one. This is, this is a 1908 Aladdin lamp. And for the next... Uh, uh, 20, 25 years, they all basically look like this. They are mantle lamps, they burn kerosene, and they illuminate uh, a mantle by incandescence, by heating uh, through the burner here. The signature is a tall chimney, uh, and you can recognize Aladdin lamps in your flea markets and antique shops because they, they should have a tall chimney to get the draft, uh, so they provide light. And, and they provide light, uh, 60, 50 candle power of light, like a light bulb. These, these were enormously popular and wonderful lights for the countryside where they were burning regular kerosene flatwick lamps uh, throughout the teens and 20s and, and uh, early years. Uh, traveling salesmen, Jim, would, would travel through the farm side country and they would leave a lamp overnight for people to try. <laughs> because this lamp cost four dollars and ninety-five cents, and that was a lot of money in 1910. And yes. and people would try it, and they would compare it to their twenty-five cent lamp. But it did such a great job that they would elect to keep it. And so the Aladdin lamps went through all these models. Today they make model 23. They are still being made. Uh, we can get parts to restore your lamp if you can get it out of your storage. It's a wonderful for times when the power's out. So all the parts are available today to restore your family keepsakes, really. Uh, let me ask you a question. I know, are all Aladdin lamps, are any of them uh, what you call a flat wick lamp, or are they all different type? No, the, the, the Aladdin lamp is a round wick lamp. In other words, the air comes up through the center of the round wick to feed the flame through this round wick. That's, that's a big change from the old flat wicks, which are, are burned primarily for a, a flame. We're trying to get light from a flame. Then, then we make this wick larger, so we get a larger wick, bigger flame, and then some burners had two wicks, so we get more light. But even so, this, this will only put out 10, 12 candle power of light, maybe 15. Whereas this Aladdin round wick lamp will put out 50 candle power of light. And it's not a flame we're trying to use for illumination, it's heat to try to incandesce this mantle. So basically, the, uh, the, the, what I would call the wick part of this was strictly just to wick the fuel up, wasn't it? That's correct, that's correct. And it's a kerosene fuel, which is very safe. Another, another trick that the traveling salesman tried to, tried to convince you that these were safe lamps is he would extinguish his match in kerosene. Because back in the, those days, in 1900 to 1910, a lot of your fuels had uh, naphtha or other volatile things in them, and fires and explosions were a problem. And so Aladdins were touted as safe, and they burned a safe fuel, and you don't dare put a 
kerosene or some other kind of fuel in one of these lamps. That, that'd be terribly, terribly dangerous. So kerosene was not only was a it was a safe fuel also. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do something here that we've never done before. We're gonna light that lamp on this show here. So if you would uh, explain that to us now, if if I'm correct, you said if they can focus in here, they can actually see a blue flame. That's the idea. Do you want to light this now? Yeah, let's okay. light it now. So uh, so if if uh, this camera can kind of zoom in right here, we're gonna see a blue flame here. Okay. Well. Good kerosene should be clear as water. So we have kerosene in here. We handle the chimney, mantel, and gallery all as one unit, and we light the wick, which I'll have to light the match first, of course. We light the wick. Now that's what a lot of lamps would use right. for light. Uh, yes. And we're putting out smoke in the air and stuff like that. So that's not our goal here. Our goal here, and if you can see I that, can, I can see the blue light. You can light. see that, Jim. That's a blue yeah. light. That's that's burning, virtually complete combustion, and it's making heat. Okay, so we now turn this up, and that blue flame expands and heats the mantle. It's the heating of the mantle that makes it incandesce. So back in those days, they actually called some of these lamps incandescent lamps. Uh, because the light bulb was incandescent and they said this is just as good as a light bulb. So the heat is actually creating the light <coughs> and not the flame. That's correct. We're, we have incandescence here and this is putting out as much as 2,000 BTUs of heat. This, is, this is like a small heater. Yeah, it's bright. And you you see, can't hardly just constantly look at it, you know. It, that's, how, that's how bright it is. Well, that's why they put shades on them, too. You put a shade on it, and you could read, read here at the tabletop at night. This expanded the workday, expanded the, the housewife could sew, and the children could study by the, their lamps at night. That's, that's interesting. I feel the heat here, right? Just this yeah, close yeah. to it. Well, I, you know, I think you can go ahead and turn it off now because they've seen, and it's interesting how, how that works, though. And uh, you could you could adjust it at different levels for different sure. for different lights and everything. Now, to, it, now to turn it out, we just give it a little puff. <laughs> Oops. And it's out. Did and the gentleman out. who uh, started this invent this little thing? Is he the one who started that? She's talking you about know, the, the this, wick part, the wick. I guess. This, this is a hundred-year-old technology that actually goes back to 1794, 1784, somewhere in there when Mr. Argan in France patented, he got a patent on this idea of air coming through a tube. And so the, the first lamps that went from flat wick to round wick were better lamps. But then when Mr. Welsbach uh, in Europe came along in 1885 and invented this mantle in 1885, we combined the center draft with a mantle and presto, we have a better uh, incandescent lamp. Now these mantles became more popular actually for gas lighting and for, you know, cities would, would hook you up for, right. for gas and, and they had street lights and they had, you know, lots of other kinds of, of lighting. Uh, so kerosene mantle lighting was probably not the biggest use. But the Aladdin lamp is probably the premier kerosene mantle lamp made in the world today. Now this one was developed in 19 what? 19 and 8. All right, that's the number, you've got number 12 over there. Let's look at that for a minute. Here's a number 12. Uh, now number 12 is, you know, virtually the same shape. We have a different mantle uh, support. We have a different wick support. And of course as they went along they improved the technology. They improved the manufacturing. They, they tried to make them more economical, and, and they maintained the same price. This lamp still costs $4.95 in 1928, 1930. Is that what it costs today? <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> what, but, what to, is, but, what? but today, this lamp might what? cost $75 to $100. Well, right. what's, what's the antique value of this lamp? Oh goodness! This number one lamp is worth several hundred dollars. Yeah, I yes. was going to say, yes. you know, four ninety-five or four hundred and ninety-five. That you're close. Yes. <laughs> no, that's me, correct. And, and this Model Twelve is a very common lamp. A lot of collectors have them. This this is just as practical as one made today. I bet these uh, are hard to but find. But still, though, this is this is still a seventy-five or hundred-dollar lamp. 
And these are very hard to find today. Yeah. Complete in this condition. Now, does anybody make the fake ones? You know, because this happens with a lot of antiques. You can't tell. I mean, unless you really are an expert, whether it's antique or it's real. You, you ask a very good question. Uh, uh, the company is still in business today making new Aladdin lamps. This is a branded product, a trademark product. There are fakes or right. there are reproductions. Knockoffs. Knockoffs, yeah, yeah, in the market. And that's one of the things I do. I, I publish a newsletter and I publish a collector's manual and I try to keep collectors up to date and tell them how to tell the difference because a, a knockoff is just not fair to, to a right. collector. Well, we want to talk about some things that you publish uh, and, and, and have written and more about the, the, the company today, but we need to take a break right now. And uh, during this break, Jeanette and Pam will get together and talk about nutrition. Uh, interesting enough, I know from some of the history I've read, they actually used some of these lamps to cook with, didn't they? Uh, oh. The, the principle, yes. Well, they, they had uh, adaptions so they could heat yeah. water and do things like yeah. that, sure. So uh, we're going to get into some more interesting things uh, when we come back. And you stay tuned as Janetta and Pam talk to us about nutrition. Welcome, Pam Ward, back today with us. She is the registered dietitian at Western Baptist Hospital, and she is nice enough to come and share with us every week. And we really enjoy the information that you give us, so we thank you for being here again today. You're very welcome. And uh, what are we going to talk about today? Well, today I want to talk about allergies and food labeling. Um, allergies, food allergies are a lot more prominent than people realize and it's very difficult sometimes to read a label and determine if it's got that food in it because sometimes it'll just give you like a group of foods, you know, some sort of milk protein or some sort of vegetable oil and it makes it very difficult. So as of January 1st, they've had to change the labeling on foods to show you what foods are in it to, to help those folks with allergies. They've identified over 160 foods that cause allergies. 160? 160, wow. but more than 90% are, are caused by one of eight foods. So the vast majority of people with food allergies, these labels will help. They are going to have to list if they're milk or milk products, eggs, fish, crustacean shellfish, um, peanuts, tree nuts, and soy, because those are by far the top allergens in the, the United States. So and those are all going to be- tree nuts? Tree nuts, mm -hmm. And then the thing is, that's, that's really nice about it is, whereas in the past they could just say nuts. Now they'll have to either say nuts and then put in parentheses exactly what nut it is, or list it, you know, very specifically. Um, because especially with nuts, they're ground up in something, you can't tell what it is. Oh no. You know, now obviously if you're looking at it, you can tell, but you know, these are foods that, that may have small amounts in. And you know, for people that are allergic, say to peanuts, you know, rather than vegetable oil, they'll have to say peanut oil. So it'll make it, it'll make it quite a bit easier. Okay. Uh, now wheat, I know wheat was not one of those things, but are, are, aren't a lot of people allergic to wheat? They are. Um, a lot of people have either celiac sprue or you know they, they suffer from a gluten sensitivity, whatever you want to call it, and they will have to label um, wheat, but the problem is they don't have to label any other sources of gluten. So these folks with celiac sprue, they can tell if it has wheat, but also barley, uh, rye can affect um, celiac sprue, and those won't have to be listed. You know, so it's still, still going to be a a problem there. However, they may start listing foods as gluten-free. You know, they do have that option. Right. So obviously that would make it um, make it a great deal easier. And celiac sprue is actually much more common than we realize. Um, some estimates say that one out of 133 Americans has it. The problem is it's it's terribly underdiagnosed. So that's what I've heard that you know some children. Uh, get it, and then the, it takes them a long time to find out what's wrong with them. Sometimes it literally takes years. Um, t and that can be awful. Years or more. It can because, and with the thing with celiac sprue too, is it can be symptomatic, you know, and those are the folks that, that 
feel bad, have all the GI problems, tend to be very thin because their body's not absorbing right. But you can also be asymptomatic and not have any of the problems. But you would think, well, then what's the big deal? If I don't have any problems, what's the big deal? Unfortunately, with celiac sprue, if it's not treated correctly, um, you're at higher risk for certain types of cancers. Oh. So whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, you know, it's something you want to address. And it's, that's probably one of the most difficult diets, I think, to follow is a gluten-free diet because you're looking at additives, you know, to, to foods. You're looking, obviously, at bread products, at pasta, all those things. But even some of your medicines, your over-the-counter medicines, you have to watch. You know, what's in them is a, is a thickener or a stabilizer because those can cause problems, too. It's just, uh, you know, I mean, we've been blessed, but I mean, I, I know that there are a lot of people who have a lot of problems with allergies and different things like this. And we see it, we see it a lot. And of course, you know, obviously, typically I'm dealing with sick people, so we are already have some issues, so, you know, right. obviously we definitely want to, to address the food allergies. A lot of times people don't realize what's causing their problem. They never make the correlation with when I eat this, it makes me sick, right? you know, because we tend to rarely eat one item at a time. So often it'll take, it'll take quite some time um, to weed out, you know, what's causing the problem. And again, with celiac sprue, it can take years. Fortunately, some of our GI doctors in this area are very, very good about testing for it if there's even a hint that that's what it may be because it's, it's, it's not a, a big test. And so, you know, we're starting to see it diagnosed here more probably more in the last two years than I've seen in the last 15 years. But it's because we're becoming more aware of it and we're realizing how common it is, you know, that it's much, much more prevalent than we ever, ever imagined. Okay. Uh, what are some of the other things that, uh, that are really, I know that a lot of people are allergic to milk. A lot of people are lactose intolerant. Right. And, you know, if, if it's a lactose issue, there are several over-the-counter medications you can take to address that, like lactaid. Um, with your lactose, it, when you're lactose sensitive, you're missing lactase in your body to break down the lactose. So by taking it in liquid form or pill form, you can handle that. Oh, okay. But some people are sensitive to the milk proteins and that's not treated nearly as easily. And you know, powdered milk or powdered milk products are often used in foods. And again, it's not something you would expect, so right. it'll be nice to see that it is on the label to help those folks out. But you know, like when you go to someone's house, you don't want to ask them. I know. Because they wouldn't know anyway right. most of the time. Right. It, does it have this or that in it? And uh, it's like a restaurant. You know, you it's very difficult to know how something was prepared. Right. And people that are gluten sensitive, sometimes they're so sensitive that even if something with gluten in it was prepared on that area, and then their food is prepared on it, it can cause problems. Now, not everyone's that sensitive, yeah. but some are. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today, Pam, and we'll look forward to what you have to say next week. I look forward to it. Our guest today is Bill, pronounce it again, Cortner. Quarter. Quarter. 25 cents. 25 cents, quarter. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, what's the nickname you've got? Uh, we're Aladdin Knights, and I, my nickname in Among the Aladdin Knights is Bright Knight. Uh, some days I'm less bright than other days, but for example, we have a, one of our collectors in, in Connecticut. He calls himself Sir Lamps a lot. Sir Lamps a lot. So, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> so, y'all have a big group, don't you? We have uh, a newsletter that goes around the world and 15, 1,600 subscribers, and we have lots of fun. We have conventions and all. Great what, collecting group. Talk about the big convention coming up in Missouri. We have our 34th annual convention of Aladdin Knights of the Mystic Light. My newsletter is called The Mystic Light. It's in Columbia, Missouri at the Holiday Inn Select in August 3 to 5, and on the 5th, uh, the lamp show, which is the largest lamp show of antique lighting in the world, that's a big statement, but that's, that's to our best knowledge, uh, is open to the public on uh, August 5th at Holiday Inn Select uh, Expo Center, Columbia, Missouri, and people are welcome from 9, to five, nine, nine in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. Uh, there's a small admission fee. Uh, 
We invite all the lighting clubs in, in this country, plus Canada and even Europe. They come to our meeting, and you can learn mm -hmm. about all kinds of lamps, Coleman, uh, Canadian lamps, European lamps, Aladdin lamps. Uh, my philosophy, Jim, is the more you know, the stronger the hobby. So we invite right. people to teach about all kinds of antique lighting. Now, in, during the break, we found out you're our uh, former college professor. Yes, I'm retired from the University of Illinois, a uh, horticulturist, and uh, my hobby of collecting Aladdin lamps and, and writing about them has turned into a, a busy hobby. We should probably show some of his books. Uh, this is one of your books. This is uh, Aladdin, the Magic Name and Lamps. Uh, I first published that in 1971 and uh, revised it in 97. That's, that's the Bible of Aladdin lamps. That tells the history of the company, History of all the lamps, and uh, yes. Now, you revised it, and I guess this is some of the new lamps that they've come out with. No, I just took this up to uh, a turn of the century or so. No, it's, uh, it's mostly old lamps. Uh, and as the company develops new products, uh, you know, they become uh, collectible. Right, right. Because all the lamps today, Jim, are, are signed and dated on the bottom of the lamps. Oh, oh I didn't know that. So they're all signed. Today. And this book here? This, this is uh, Aladdin Electric Lamps. And this is about the, the lamps that the company made starting in 1930. And, and in 1956, the competition was so strong, they just had to quit. I mean, uh, uh, they couldn't afford to compete anymore, so they, they stopped making them. But uh, in 19... 27, 28, they bought a glass factory in Indiana, and they started making little uh, electric lamps. For example, here's a, here's a little figurine boudoir lamp, a little Cupid, and they made little cute shades to go on them, and they made glass kerosene lamps. So now we had colors of lamps as opposed to just a brass and nickel right. plated lamp. They were prettier. So we got into lots of different colors of glass, and, and this allowed the company to sell more lamps. But electric lamps were, were popular for quite a while, from the 30s and the 40s. After the war, the company couldn't compete. They went into pottery. And in fact, you might, I'm, I'm squeezing the table here a little bit. <laughs> After the war, they, they got into some lamps that we think are downright ugly. And as collectors, we have contests to see who can find the ugliest Aladdin <laughs> lamp. So, you know, back in those uh, Deco 50s, uh, some of those periods, uh, we have some fun with these lamps. Well, let's talk about the, the Bakelite lamp because I was, uh, I was interested in that one because Bakelite is kind of from my era of the 50s. And uh, I thought it was pretty interesting if you look at Bakelite. This is a Bakelite Aladdin. Uh, this is from Australia. This was made in Australia. And the burners were made in either England or the United States and shipped there, and then they made the lamps. Now, you notice one thing that's very interesting here. This is taller than the American lamps. And Australia even has taller ones. They called this one a personal lamp because I would use this on my table. They also had one called a family lamp, which is taller, which would light a larger area on a table. So they were very practical-minded and down under, you might say. Are they real collectible? Oh, yes. I know Bakelite is going through a, a time right now where it's very collectible. Radio, jewelry, Bakelite jewelry, the, the prices they get for that today. If you want one of these, you better know somebody in Australia or go down there and uh, you might find one. And even then, these, these are hard to find and they're, yeah. they're valuable to collectors. Yeah. Then let's talk about some of the glass. I know you've brought one of the cobalt ones and uh, my wife is a collector of cobalt oh, to some okay. extent. Yes, we do. Yes, we collect a lot of. Well, this is, this, is, uh, this is the benefit of owning a glass factory now and being able to produce nice colors. So in 1938, uh, they made a nice ruby lamp. Very pretty. Very pretty. Very desirable. Very, very much in demand among collectors. 1940, they made a cobalt lamp. Only Love made it that. Only made it for one year, and they're scarce and hard to find. And they're they're quite valuable. And I mean, you can find one, latch on to it. Yeah, huh? Absolutely. You, you said one that's in good pristine condition is worth about a thousand dollars. And the cobalt, yes. Yeah. But but you asked earlier about uh, knockoffs, and this has been reproduced. So right. you know, be very careful because uh, uh, you can pay you, a lot of money for something that's not it worth not it. It's not worth it. That's right. Yeah. Well, we've had just a few minutes left. I think we've pretty well covered most of the 
the lamps, and it's been real interesting. But let's talk about some of the writing, because I know uh, the company is still in existence. Now, you and a group of other people got together and bought the company. Is that what I understand? Yes, in 1999, a group of us collectors, just, just collectors, we bought the lamp division from Aladdin Industries in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm. And in 2000, we moved it to Clarksville, Tennessee, and, and collectors or anyone interested is welcome to stop by in, in Clarksville. Uh, see the showroom, uh, learn more about Aladdin lamps. And this is the current catalog? That's a cover on one of my newsletters where I'm oh. showing one of the new lamps that they made. Oh, okay. okay. I had no idea it was so close. The, the yes. Well, I knew, the, yes. I knew of Aladdin in Nashville. I was born and raised in Nashville. And, and I know you talked about wartime. I know during wartime they went into uh, production of, of things for the, the war effort uh, at that time. And uh, I guess it was the way of a lot of industries that did that. They just never did get back up to where they were, did they? Well, they, during the war, they, they actually had lanterns. So they mm -hmm. had cooking stoves. They had ski stoves that were uh, carried by uh, armed forces. Right. And, and these small stoves burned kerosene or they burned gasoline. They burned any fuel. And, and the armed forces out in the, out in the wilderness could, could... Yeah, they were dual fuel. Eat fuel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And now another thing I want to talk about is the history of Aladdin Lamps that you put together, a little booklet. Now, Dan, our director, has the website uh, or your email address. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill has said anyone that would like a copy of this, he'll be glad to send it to you. Now, you can uh, email him or you can go to our website, thefabulous50s.com. And I'm sorry, thefabulous50s, 50 spelled out, dot net. And you can email us there and we'll be sure to see that you get a copy of this if you'd like one. It's an interesting little book called The History of Aladdin Lamps. And so if you're interested in that, we'll be glad to, to get this to you. And then talk about, we have just a little bit of time left, but these two books here that you put together. I have two collector's manuals, Jim. One on the kerosene lamps only and one on electric Aladdin lamps only. Um, what you're showing here are the 2006 editions and I try to update information about Aladdin lamps to the collectors, how to tell the reproductions, how to identify them, uh, kerosene lamps, how to light them and restore them. Uh, just just up-to-date tips on how to enjoy your lamps. Well, Bill, we appreciate this. We're out of time. And it always seems that way when we get a good, interesting topic. And Janet and I appreciate you being with us today. And we look forward to getting together again. At, uh, we met you at a show and seeing you again. but. If you have any interest in any information, be sure to write us or to uh, email us, uh, and Janetta will give you our address. Janetta? It's P.O. Box 7, Bowes, Kentucky, 42027. Remember, use it or lose it. Can't see as well as I used to Can't run as far or as fast Sometimes I think that the old me Is becoming exactly that But when I start thinking of all I don't have That's when I tell poor me Beethoven was 50 and deaf as a post When he wrote his ninth symphony